What you are about to witness is a fascinating interview with a gentleman called Christopher Spencer, or rather that is his pen name. He has to conceal his real name. In the following interview, Christopher speaks about his 50 plus years in the world of high level finance, both as a banker and a finance and investment broker. He covers everything from international espionage to covert financial agreements, con men, murder, war, and more, with a touch of personal flair. Everything you are about to hear is true. Some questions were pre-agreed and scripted to explain specific content in his books. Most are not. You can find details of where to buy his books in the video description below. This is part six. Okay, question time. I understand that after you had spent the 1970s in the financial centre of the City of London, you then moved into the international construction business. Why? Um, I suppose the City of London in those days was not like it is today. It was a very pleasant place to work. I worked in a couple of major merchant banks. Um, they were very nice people. Uh, a lot of them had titles. I didn't have a title, <laughs> by which I mean Lord or Lady or uh, Sir or whatever. Um, they were very well educated. Most of the people I worked with had gone to a leading public school. I was a grammar school boy. Um, I'd gone to a, uh, they'd gone to Oxford or Cambridge. I'd gone to a College of London University. Um, people believed in those days that the fact that the City of London had a motto, that motto was, my word is my bond. And therefore, if you made a promise, if you agreed a deal, you kept to it. Otherwise, your reputation wouldn't, would be nothing if you were found out not to keep to your word. But it was also a uh, increasingly a dog-eat-dog -dog situation. And of course, when the Big Bang in 1983 was introduced by the government, a lot of uh, foreign banks came in, Americans, Germans, etc., and they bought up the old merchant banks and the old um, stockbrokers, and the city changed considerably, and it became even more dog-eat-dog. -dog. Um, I felt in the end, having worked in, first of all, in clearing banking, and then in merchant banking, and then in investment banking, that I'd probably had a sufficient experience of that world. And I wanted to move out of the financial, the pure financial world into uh, the real world. And this construction group came along. I'd done some work for them in the particular bank that I was when working in. And they offered me a job, or to be exact, they offered me an interview. And I met the head of their construction uh, director uh, of construction. And he was a hell of a nice guy. And I had a couple of hours with him. And at the end of that, he offered me a job. And I thought, yeah, why not? I'll get into the real world of construction. There's nothing like really a building or building a building to get into the real world. Whatever it is, be it a house or a hotel or a factory or a bridge. And all these things were built by the construction group that I joined. It was a very wide group with all kinds of activity. And I was given the job of getting the money together for the projects they were building, both in the UK and overseas. And that was very interesting, but a very hard job. I had to do a lot of traveling. I also got involved in dealing with the British government and also with governments overseas. And I learned all about that. So it was a positive move as far as I was concerned. It brought in a new set of experiences. So, from my point of view, the idea that banking was ever a nice place to work seems odd. Can you tell me what you think about the common conception of banking now compared to then, and as in whether or not it's close to reality? Or... Yes, I think banking in the old days was uh, a person-to-person a -person business. I mean, when I started in banking at the age of 17, I was in a branch of a clearing bank. It was Lloyd's Bank, actually. 
And you know, it was a then a personal situation when you the the uh, bank manager had a a standing within the town or in the part of the city that he was working. He was a member of the local golf club, and you know he was mixing with the local lawyers and accountants, etc. Um, the people in the branch were friends with the clients of that branch because they saw them practically every day. The shopkeeper used to come in with his takings. Um, the personal customer used to come in with their problems. And in those days, everything was done within the branch. The uh, customer wanted to buy or sell shares. They didn't go to a call center. They came into their branch and they asked the, the security clerk, as he was called, to buy or sell this shares for them. They wanted some foreign currency, exactly the same. If they had a problem, a financial problem, they asked to see the bank manager and he tried to, to help them. So it was very much a personal business. These days, unfortunately, it's not a personal business anymore. The branches of the banks, they no longer carry out the many of the services which we then offered. Um, if you want some help, you have to call a call centre and you know you sit listening to the very nice music uh, for an hour or an hour and a half in order to get through to speak to somebody. Then they try to be very helpful to you. Of course they do. But it's not the same as having your problems sorted out actually in a local location. I think the people in those days in the branches were far better educated as to what they could do to help their customers. These days, they do not appear to really know the problems that people actually encounter within their financial circumstances. As far as the City of London is concerned, yes, it was a lot different. As I've said, um, you found that the uh, creme de la creme of society really worked there the people from public schools, the people that had gone to Oxbridge, and they were very nice people. Um, they were very civilised. They didn't have to work for a living. End of story. They worked because they wanted to work. They worked because they were interested. They worked because they wanted to do something in life. Um, and because of that, they had a, a, an attitude, of, a very relaxed attitude but also a, 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 an attitude which was very dedicated to what they wanted to do. And that was a nice atmosphere. Um, we used to have what, every morning what they called the prayer session. We met with the director and just exchanged ideas every morning for about an hour. That was a very uh, good way of bringing everybody into the situation. And you sat in a big room, I did in one of the banks, and um, everybody in the room, else in the room, did, everybody had a title. <laughs> Not me, but I was the only one that didn't. But they were really nice people. And uh, I enjoyed that. Uh, um, and uh, I think now that would never be countenanced. Um, that wouldn't happen. But then it did. And it made for an atmosphere which was very pleasant. I'm afraid the city in many ways has lost its way since the Big Bang. It's all now about money. It's no longer about service. It's no longer about service to individual customers or individual companies. In those days it was. Yes, you made some money, of course. You had to in order to continue in business. But nowadays it's about maximizing that money very often at the expense of providing a service to other people. On that note, what do you think of the fractional reserve banking system? Well, that always existed. Uh, when I was in, in banking, my, in clearing banking, you learned that you took in deposits. And obviously, you were able to lend more than those deposits. I mean, maybe five or six times more than those deposits, because not everybody would come back on the same day and demand that they get all that money back in cash. Um, of course, the method of uh, payments 
that we had in those days, it was based upon checks. These days, of course, it's based upon simple transfers of money or using your debit card. Um, but that system of m m not without money, money changes around from one account to another, which means the amount of deposits that a bank has is usually rather the same. So they don't have to worry, except when there's the proverbial run on a bank. When the confidence in the bank starts to wane and people start to take their money out either in cash or by in terms of payments, then of course the stability of that particular bank will start to suffer. I mean, we've seen it recently with the bank in California, Silicon Valley Bank. As soon as the rumours started that it was in trouble, everybody started taking their money out. And of course, at a certain point in time, that has to stop because the bank will collapse and the bank has to be put into a liquidation form and the deposits that have been put into it have to be tried to be recovered. Yeah, it seems odd that we've set up an entire financial system based on something that flimsy because it's just ridiculous. It just happened in China as well. Mm. Um, you know, several of the banks out there, especially with the branches out of the main cities, they've all just ended up in serious trouble because people were doing the same thing. They were, they were doing runs on the banks because six billion just disappeared. So, you know, the whole thing was very complicated, but it nearly ruined the entire economy, the country's entire economy. You know, it just seems odd that we still have that now. Do you think that with the advent of digital processing, perhaps there should have been a limit placed on the amount that could be lent based uh, on, a, on a deposit? I think that the position in China is because the government of China has run the banking system. It hasn't allowed the bankers, the Chinese bankers, to make the kind of credit decisions that they should actually make. I mean, the, the uh, system of uh, lending out more than the money you deposited has been around for hundreds of years, literally hundreds of years. And that has always been the basic of banking, both here in the UK, in the United States, uh, in all the other countries that have taken up that particular system. But where you have a government actually controlling the banking system and trying to say to the bankers, you shall lend money in this way and to this particular company, um, then of course there is the danger that uh, in fact bankers do not make the proper judgment on the security of the loans that they are making. And that I think has happened in China. The other thing that, has, of course, has happened in China has been this enormous growth uh, encouraged by the government. And a lot of that growth has been in the property sector as well as in the foreign trade area where they've been exporting. But a lot has been in the property sector. And that has happened, of course, in other countries. It's happened in, in the UK. It happened in Ireland. It happened in Spain, where too many houses were built because of this property boom. And then, of course, we found that there were a lot of empty properties. People couldn't no longer buy properties. And as a result, there was a, a lot of bad debt within the banks. And um, the banks then had to be rescued. What happened in the United States uh, and the result of in 2008 of the banking crash was, of course, something a bit more complicated than that. New methods of lending were devised and then, because they were new methods which nobody really understood, they were let rip. And as a result of that, bad credit decisions were taken. And in the end, they, the problems came home to the banks and the banking crisis came about. And the government then had to step in to bolster the banks up and secure them, taking shareholdings wherever necessary. And that actually, in the end, uh, did lower the standard of living for ordinary people.